Yeah, so th thanks very much uh, uh, for the introduction and the invite to, to come and talk today. And it is a, a great honor. I mean, 15 years of this particular organization, I want to congratulate Nicola and uh, everybody involved, Nilfa, and what an important job that they have performed over the last 15 years. And, um, you know, I suppose my job today is a little bit to give some information relating to the medical condition of lung fibrosis. Um, and, um, you know, these can be difficult talks to, to give because obviously some people know a little bit more about conditions than others and it means different things to everybody in the room, I think. Um, so I'm going to make that effort, but obviously the key is to answer questions as we go along or at the end even, whichever is easier for, for people in the room. So the way I was going to structure this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the general features of the condition, a little bit of what we know about it. Um, I think it's important to talk a little bit about um, how I consider this affects the lungs um, you know, and, and the body. Uh, I think it's important we talk a little bit about treatment and then obviously very important that we update on where we are uh, in this country in 2017 in this condition. And you know, the, the basic summary of lung fibrosis in general and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in particular is that um, uh, we do need to know more about this condition. We, we don't know the exact cause of it. And in many medical conditions, uh, we know a lot about the condition, but we don't know exactly why people get it or what causes it. And sometimes those are areas that may be maybe many years away. And um, you know, we're building you know, data to try and understand this as much as we can. But we do need to know a little bit more about it. And I think particularly in this country, you know, organizations like ILFA, but uh, there's a, a momentum of people in this country with a very strong interest in learning more about the disease in Ireland particularly. And I think we don't know enough about uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in Ireland yet, but I think we're, as I say in the last uh, line there, we're, we're definitely making progress in this regard, which is, which is, which is uh, very important for all of us. Um, so, so the first thing is, you know, fibrosis is a term that doesn't really mean anything to most people. And what it means to us is scarring, scarring of the lungs. And if you look at our skin and we scar our skin, you'll see on the slide there that if you cut your skin, it heals up and you get a, maybe a little white line where the scar has occurred. Um, uh, in the scarring of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we get the same sort of repair in the lung but it is abnormal. It doesn't do its own kind of uh, switch off. So why do we not, when we cut our skin, can keep building scar tissue? There's a signal that turns off the scar tissue, tells us that it's time to stop making scar tissue. And the mechanism in the lung and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is that that mechanism of turn off seems to be broken. We make too much scar tissue in the lung. And it doesn't affect, the lung is a very, very delicate organ and it, it affects a part of the lung called the interstitium. So you'll hear that term sometimes in, when people are talking about lung fibrosis. And it's almost like a very delicate little lace work structure that supports the other parts of the lungs, the blood vessels and the other bits of the lungs that are involved in bringing oxygen in and out. And it's a support structure that seems to get um, rigid and scarred in that particular process. The symptoms typically are a little bit of cough and shortness of breath, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And uh, because, as I said, the scar tissue doesn't turn off normally, it gets a little bit worse over time. And the rate of that, as I'll show you on slides, can be quite variable. Um, but it's something that we know if, if this condition is, is there, that it will slowly get worse over time. Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately, because we don't know the cause of it, I can't tell you exactly what is that signal that turns that lung to get worse over time. And about 66% of all people come into our clinics with scarring in the lungs, we don't find a cause. And I'll show you some of the potential causes, but, uh, but that's only a third at most of the people that we would see with these uh, conditions. So I put on the next slide just to orientate you towards the, the, the term. It's called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So uh, we've said already idiopathic means we don't know the cause of it. And that's what the term, you know, we, we, we come up with these rather complex terms to describe something that, that's fairly obvious, but it's called idiopathic in medicine. Uh, pulmonary, instead of calling it lung, we call it pulmonary, again, to make things complicated. And that's the lung. And then fibrosis is scarring. So that's really what the term means when we see it. Uh, so what about the, the process here? Now, we know that this condition is more common now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. I mean, I think that's very clear. And it's not just that we're better at doing CT scans and making a diagnosis. There is an increase in the amount of this condition we're seeing. It may in, in part be related to the, um, um, how long people are living because as you get older, the prevalence of this disease becomes more common. 
This is data from the United Kingdom, and you can say it's a little bit out of date because we haven't good prevalence studies around the world in terms of longitudinal studies, but we have some information on this. I and mean, This is a good study from GP practices in the UK, and you can see the line, the dots go up on that screen each time, each um, three-year period. It seems to be a little bit more common. If you look at data from the United States or information from the United States, if you um, um, live to the age of 70, the rate of this disease can be as much as 220 cases per 100,000. And I'm going to show you data from the UK or a statement from the UK in a second to say that that may in fact be an underestimation. But at the moment, we're predicting that there'll be about 400 people diagnosed this year with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in Ireland. And there would be about 1,000 people living in this country with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, the reason I say that it's worth looking at the, you know, the, where else, other parts of the world, is because the data captured, the understanding of this condition is a little bit better in other parts of the world. And um, the British Lung Foundation um, uh, produced a very, very, uh, I think, uh, good and helpful um, uh, uh, statement and workshop on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and other related diseases just in September. And they estimated, based on their data, that um, perhaps we're underestimating the prevalence of this condition by 50%. So instead of us being having 1,000 people in this country, it may be as high as 2,000. And our own sense as uh, clinicians, nurses, doctors, physiotherapists looking after patients with this condition is that it is more common than we, uh, than we would have considered two or three years ago. And I think, I think we're, we're, you know, this is something that we're hoping to capture a little bit more information on, but you can see how it's a condition that's, that's probably uh, quite, quite common. And the day, again, the UK have suggested that um, for every 100 people who die of a disease in, in England, that one may in fact have lung fibrosis. And you can see that that would be uh, a lot more than we would have probably previously thought. Generally speaking, men are more susceptible to this condition than women, about 50% higher chance of getting the condition than women. But it still uh, crosses both genders without a doubt. Uh, about 85% of the diagnoses we make are over the age of 70. It's quite rare, in fact, extremely rare to be diagnosed with this condition less than the age of 50. It's pretty rare 50 to 60. And then after the age of 60, it becomes more common that we see this condition. Uh, we don't know the cause. Uh, genetic risks. We would have said um, uh, probably 10 years ago that there were no genetic risks for this disease, that it didn't have any difference between different populations. But we now know that that's not the case. And we're only at the beginning of understanding the genetic risks, but we do know that some people are born and made with risks for, for, for developing this condition. And there is some uh, um, information coming out that perhaps if you're Northern Celt or uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon, possibly that those gene frequencies are higher, which means that they're carried more in the population. So we may, in fact, have a little bit more of this condition here than other parts of the world. But again, these are evolving stories, that, and that's why it's so important. And again, I would say in the last 10 years, the amount of information and the amount of people studying this condition will provide us with a lot more information than we have prior to that. Um, and although we don't know the environmental cause, uh, I think it's important, first of all, to recognize that about 60% of people who develop this condition smoke. So some of this does relate to injuring the lung in some way. Uh, asbestos exposure, we know, produces exactly the same condition as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but we call it asbestosis because the asbestos is the driving force or the trigger for the condition. Certain medications that people take can produce an identical uh, uh, picture, but they're rare, and we will have screened everybody when people come in, make sure you haven't been taking certain medicines that can trigger this in the lung, and you will have, if you've met doctors, you'll know why we ask those questions. And then there are certain <coughs> rheumatological conditions, and this is rheumatoid arthritis. And again, the reason I put that in, rheumatoid arthritis, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, it can produce an identical picture in the lung to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the idiopathic side is those people People where we don't know the cause, and then we find about a third of the people who come in, maybe something in the environment, some, a medication, a rheumatological condition that is part of the process. And the way we work through this is we meet as a group of doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, radiologists, and we go through each um, uh, person's history, uh, put together all the story, look at the history, look at the blood tests, look at the x-rays, and try and define what exactly is the diagnosis. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have rheumatoid arthritis interstitial or fibrotic lung disease. If we don't have rheumatoid arthritis and we can find no other cause, we call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but they're very similar in many respects. So will we find more environmental aspects that probably are 
important in this disease. I suspect we will as we go forward, but uh, we do have relatively limited information on that at the moment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about symptoms and examination, um, just to give you some idea of how I suppose we might conceptualize what this condition looks like. And um, it's, it's a condition that essentially affects the respiratory system and nowhere else really. And therefore it causes the major respiratory symptoms that we see are cough and shortness of breath. So that's what this condition um, really drives in terms of, that's why people <coughs> come to see us uh, unless their GP has listened to their chest with a stethoscope and heard crackles in the lungs. So when you hear the, 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 the things in clinic, and that's what I'm going to try and do over the next few slides, is we're looking at how the breathing is, do you have a cough? Um, some people look at the fingernails to see if there's a little bit of clubbing on the fingernails, which is a change in the fingernails in this condition, and predominantly when you listen to the actual chest, it's whether there is crackles on exam. So if we look at this, and I know this is probably a fairly crude representation of the lungs, but uh, the lungs are ruffular, roughly triangular in shape. And the lungs are really delicate structures, and they're made out of millions and millions of little balloons called alveoli. And those balloons are really easy to blow up, uh, to inflate and deflate. It's very easy for them to actually move. So it's very easy for normal lungs to expand and deflate normally. And in lung fibrosis, the lungs become smaller, because they become stiffer. And scar tissue is stiff, it's hard to move. So we use the term compliance, which means it's how easy it is to inflate and deflate a balloon, and they become incompliant. You cannot inflate the balloon very easily. I'm gonna show you some analogies of that in a second. But if you look at this going from a very, you know, um, really delicate structure to quite a coarse structure, which I've sort of put up as a kind of a mat-like structure, but it is really that difference in terms of the physiology of the lungs is that kind of condition. Um, but if you look at what happens with that, is so when scars occur, the lungs become smaller. And this is just somebody's chest x-ray. And you can see on the x-ray that in um, 2014, this is the lung here, this black area here. So that's our diaphragm on either side, and that's the top of the lung, and the heart is in the middle. And over the three years, you can see that the size of the lungs have become smaller. I mean, it's, you know, it's not something that's it's quite clear to us that that person's capacity in their lung is smaller over three years. The diaphragms are now up here, so they've lost about a third of their lung capacity. So that's, that's what x-rays look like. And if we go back over a number of years, this condition precedes, it's there before symptoms occur. And you can see slowly over time that the lung gets smaller. Now, in our days, we've moved towards things called CT scans. And I think probably most people in the room understand what a CT scan is, you know, a, uh, a machine that people, um, you know, lie in and takes numerous pictures of your lungs. But it's different. The, a CT scan is like taking a cheese slice across the chest. So you take a slice and then you can take that lung and look at it this way. So it's like taking the top of me off and picking me up and looking up into or towards my head. And you're just seeing a, a, a very thin slice of the lung. So if you can think of a cheese slicer down through a chunk of cheese, that's what it does. It actually can give us that level of resolution of the lung. And it does it in such a, a very, very thin way that we can see the architecture of the lung very well. So again, just a step over here, this is the front and this is your vertebrae at the back. So you're lying on your back here in this situation, this x-ray, and this is a normal lung. So we have little blood vessels that go out in the lung, and I'm gonna show you why they're there in the next slide. Uh, but you can see all that delicate little structure, that little gray hue there in the lung. That's the interstitium, where the little blood is going through and it's picking up oxygen as you go through. This is a normal lung, and then as you can see, we come over to a lung with scarring in it. What happens is all those little balloons become large cysts, and we call this honeycomb where there's a lot of fibrosis in the lung. So it's the change in that delicate structure of the lung that occurs over time. So what I showed you on the x-ray is where the lungs shrink, is when we look at a CT scan, we're looking for the pattern of scarring because we learn a lot from that and we can really uh, define the condition and make the diagnosis based on CT scans. And you don't need CT scans um, every time you come to the clinic appointment but you need CT scans for us to make an accurate diagnosis in the first place. And that's why the CT scan is so important. And the analogy to what happens is when the lungs get stiff, the best thing, when you think about a lung, we've traditionally always thought about, because maybe, you know, physiology goes back so many years, is those old, um, uh, uh, um, um, what are they called again, the bellows. <laughs> the bellows that were used for the, uh, for the fire in the past. And they used to be fairly stiff to use, but if they got older, they get quite stiff. And essentially the lungs is like a giant bellows. 
when it expands, it sucks air in, and when it contracts, it blows air out. So it's exactly the same mechanism. And when it gets stiffer, it's harder to inflate the bellows. It's harder to move those bellows. And it becomes harder to breathe, therefore. It takes more energy to breathe, and it takes more work to breathe. So it's harder to breathe. And again, the second analogy I use is if you look at, glove, you look at balloons, and this is just a glove that you might see in a, in a doctor's office. It's very compliant, very easy to blow up, very easy to expand. And the analogy to that, to me, would be what a rubber glove would be like, trying to blow up a rubber glove. It's the same sort of thing. So when your lungs are scarred, that's what happens, is it's harder to inflate. We call it incompliance, but it causes difficulty for you to breathe. And that gets worse when you exercise. And I'm going to show you why that is in a second. So essentially, it's that, it's that difficulty in expanding the lungs. So, so what happens is that when our lungs get scarred, we breathe a little more shallowly and a little quicker. So the breathing rate goes up a bit, and the amount of air that you're moving per breath goes down a little bit. So the, the purpose of our lungs is to bring the air in, but it's to put that oxygen-rich air close to the blood vessels so that we get oxygen into the, blood, blood, um, into the bloodstream. So that's the key aspect of what our lungs do. So how does lung fibrosis affect this? And the, the, I, I put up this analogy because what we think about in the lung is that there, it's like a conveyor belt. There's blood flowing through the lung, and that blood has to have oxygen put on it. So that conveyor belt of blood going through needs oxygen placed from the lung into, the, into it as it goes through. And it's usually very efficient. And you know, this is, if this chap is the lung who's putting the oxygen on the conveyor belt, you know, he's able to, well, it looks like a fairly challenging job there, but anyway, he's able to stay up with putting that on there. And we call that the transfer of oxygen from the lung into the blood. It's called transfer or the transfer factor. And what you'll see in, a, in another slide is it's called sometimes the DLCO. And the reason I'm putting these up is so that you have some familiarity on what we check when people come into clinic. So this uh, is fine when, you're, you know, when we're doing okay. So what happens in lung fibrosis? Well, the scar tissue sits between where the oxygen is in the lung and where the conveyor belt is. So you can imagine if this man had to step back four or five steps and have to do the same job, it's, it's less efficient to be leaning over every time. So it's harder to stay up with the oxygen. But in many times, when you're sitting at rest, it's, it's okay, it goes okay. What happens when you walk? Well, the conveyor belt has to move faster because the heart pumps faster, it pumps the, re the blood quicker, and that's when even though the, the, the lung has stepped back, it's more work to put the oxygen on the conveyor belt, that's when we seem to fail with getting the oxygen on. So the way we see that is uh, we see oxygen dropping when people walk down a corridor or do a six-minute walk test. And again, anyone who's been in a clinic with lung fibrosis realizes that you'll get walked and your oxygen will be checked frequently, and that's why we do that. So when we put that in context, we have two lungs, and we're trying to measure the function of these lungs in some way that's relevant to you as patients coming in with this condition. And the first thing we're interested in is how big is the lung? What's the size of the lung? And we do this by measuring the flow of air in and out and the capacity of the lung. There's many ways of doing that, but the, the simple test that you have in clinic is a pulmonary function test, and we measure a, a value called the vital capacity. And for the, to all intents and purposes, the vital capacity tells you the size of the lungs. So remember I was saying the lungs shrink a little bit over time on those x-rays? That's what we see, and that's the, most, that's the most reproducible and efficient way of measuring the size of the lungs. So when you come to clinic, I think most of you will have had a test done where you measure the vital capacity, and that's why we do it. The second thing is this oxygen transfer, what I just showed you on the other slides, is how efficient is the lung at getting the oxygen or the gas from the alveolus into the bloodstream? And there are two ways of doing that. We measure a thing called the DLCO. Some people call it the transfer factor. And it doesn't matter whether it basically takes a gas and it essentially simulates how good that gas and oxygen is a gas, how good it is at getting into the bloodstream. And then the second thing is we measure the oxygen on your fingertip with a, with a pulse oximeter and then when you're walking. And those are the two functions that we're measuring when you come in. Is there a change in the size of the lungs? Is there a change in the ability of the lungs to deliver oxygen? And those are the two critical issues. We don't do CT scans every time you come to clinic. What we're measuring here is a functional aspect of what would drive us to change the decision in how we're treating you. So, so that's really, uh, I suppose, the critical, the symptoms we spoke about is shortness of breath because walking the oxygen drops and because the lungs are scarred, it's harder to inflate them. What we, the reason we do lung function tests and the reason we do walk tests. And these are the tests that when patients come to our clinic in Galway that we will, um, uh, that we will do pretty much routinely on each visit. Um, now, over time, as I said, this is a condition that does get worse over time. Uh, but it's not predictable. We don't know how quickly it is going to change over time. 
and I've put up three uh, sort of lines here on the, on, the, on the slide. And what you see here is your lung function on this side. So as it comes down here, it's getting a little bit worse. And this is the timeline. And there are some people, unfortunately, where the, 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 the line of the condition can be quite rapid. But the majority of people, it's a slow, gentle decline over time. And that's why we measure at clinic appointments at different time points to see what's happening in the lung function. If you're not aware of this, it's just this line is, is a really typical pattern in lung fibrosis where essentially you can be very stable for a long period of time and then maybe get a cold or get a chest infection. And instead of it being a gentle drop, there's a fairly abrupt drop off in lung function. And then it stabilizes again. And that is the term we use for that is exacerbation. And what it means is that for some reason the scar tissue has been activated. Maybe a virus comes in and just turns the little scar tissue on a little bit more and it drops a little bit more. Uh, more rapidly from that point of view. So we are measuring the lung function from, from day to day, but we tell people if they get a cold, if they get breathless with a cold, we need to see them at that point as well. So it's measuring those two aspects of things. Now the next slide, I think, doesn't mean, I, I just put it up to show you um, what, 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 I'm, what we're thinking of when we come to treatment. Um, now, when, when I started training, this was considered a, a, a condition that was associated with inflammation. And um, this is a lung um, of somebody with lung fibrosis, but the lung is, these are the little balloons, these are the very thin wall cysts that we spoke about, which are the little alveoli. And this is what happens with scar tissue. You lose the ability to get oxygen into that area. And at the center of that is a little nidus, a little, a little this, you can probably see it here, a little ball. And that little ball has cells called fibroblasts. And those fibroblasts are, any, like any cell in the body, a skin cell, um, their job, they all have a job. And the job of the fibroblasts is to make scar tissue, which we call collagen. And that little, it, it, that, that's like a little um, nidus of activity within the lung. And that's where we believe the scar tissue originates from. And that's where we believe that the control of the scar tissue production has broken down, that it's making too much scar tissue. So instead of this being looking at, is it inflammation in the lung? We're now looking at it as something that is scar tissue and can we switch off the scar tissue? And that's really where the focus of all the attention in this condition has been in the last decade. And that's why we've made progress, I think, in treatment. I put up a few issues relating to the environment and genetics, but I've already told you that most of this is not relevant to, the, you know, to most people coming in. It's not the relevant issue, that these environmental issues are relatively unclear in most people and the genetics while they may be in the future will provide us more information and treatment uh, we don't it's not going to change where we are right today so the reason i put that up is to show you you know why we're now looking at turning off scar tissue and this is our target this is the the area of abnormality in the lung okay so i'm going just the term rct up on the board there is called a, a, a randomized control trial so the best studies we can do pretty much are called randomized control studies. And it just means that they're well-performed studies. And when I started off um, uh, looking after people with this condition, with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, everybody was getting anti-inflammatory treatments, which means they were there to reduce inflammation. Because the concept was that inflammation was driving some of this condition. It wasn't based in any good performed studies. And it took quite a few years to do a proper study on this, and it essentially was reported a little bit before that, but in a large journal, and all the work data that I'm showing you here from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, show that, in fact, when you did a randomized control trial in this condition using these medicines, they actually weren't helping. They were making things worse, not helping. So that is gone now. But up until you know, five years ago, people were still receiving that treatment for this condition, but it was the wrong treatment. The second area that was looked at is using something to look at reducing <coughs> oxygen injury. Now, what I said to you is oxygen goes into lung, but oxygen itself can be a little bit injurious. It can injury, injure the lung sometimes. And you're probably familiar with antioxidants in, 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 in foodstuffs, and they're meant to be helpful to us. So there was an interest in looking at antioxidants in the lung. And the reason for that was there was a small trial done in 2005 that looked like it helped you. And when the larger study was done, uh, it was neutral. And what we mean by neutral is we couldn't tell if it was helpful or not. So it's not harmful, but it's not clear that it's helpful. So that was disappointing. But right at the same time, I think the area of antifibrotic, those medicines that switch off that little nidus, that little activity of cells, uh, was introduced. And we now have two medicines. The first, perfinidone, switches off collagen production, but we don't know how it works. And the second, nintedanib, 
uh, uh, works on these things called factors or growth factors that turn on collagen production. And in pretty large trials, they showed very similar results in that they reduced the formation of, um, of scar tissue, or I should say, or stabilized the lung function, presumably by reducing the formation of scar tissue. So what does that mean on our curve? That what does that mean if you start these medicines? Uh, we would prefer, we'd prefer if it meant that the lung function here stayed like this, you know, forever. Uh, we're not there yet. But what we do know that if you're in this curve here and you take these medicines, the evidence is very strong that you shift up and the rate of decline of lung function is less. And if the rate of decline of lung function is less, less um, you should feel better, live longer, and those are the targets of our treatment. And we use the decline in lung function as the major indicator that a medicine is helping someone. So at the moment, the standard of care is to be on an antifibrotic treatment. Obviously, they come with some side effects, which we can talk about. Uh, but in most people, I think there are options for treatment for this condition that we didn't have four years ago. So that's where I think the progress in the last uh, decade in this condition, and it's been major compared to where we were uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so what are the treatments in 2017? Uh, exercise and rehabilitation, we're going to hear a little bit about. Uh, keep the machine as efficient as possible, which is the body that we live in. Uh, antacids, we do give most people something to reduce acid in their tummy. It's a little bit controversial still. Um, the reason we do that is we feel that some acid coming up into the lower food pipe may in fact stimulate the lung to become a little bit more inflamed or a little bit more scarred, I should say. Um, so um, most people will be on a treatment um, such as that. Everyone should, be, uh, should consider antifibrotic treatment. I'll be honest with you, it's not for everybody because of some people find it hard to take tablets, some people find it hard to take side effects, but we offer it to everybody with this condition in this country. Um, and uh, then the antioxidant, I, I don't believe the data is as strong as I would like on that. People, some people will be on that. It's called flumacil or um, N-acetylcysteine, but we, 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 we don't universally use that. And oxygen is only prescribed when your oxygen level is low or you feel you need it to exercise. But we will give oxygen where necessary. Transplantation, it's, this condition is still one of the conditions that is transplanted more than any other condition uh, in the world in the sense that it is a very eminently, um, uh, the, the, the transplant works for this condition. It's the only way of curing this condition. Uh, but as you know, transplant is not readily available to every person who needs a transplant. And that's the same all over the world. And then we obviously, we, we are very focused on symptom control. And I think to try and put all this together, and I'll show you where we are in this country in a minute, is you need multidisciplinary teams. So the, 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 the power of ILFA is involving um, everybody with the condition and all of the aspects of understanding the disease. The power of the clinic is to say that it's not just one person, it's many, many different disciplines, nursing, physiotherapy, uh, doctors, physiologists, um, and so on. Uh, so pulmonary rehabilitation, I put up just to remind, and we'll, we'll hear about this anyway, is, but basically what we're trying to do is make the machine, you know, I, I think about this, so if we look at that slide, a lot of this is relating to the lung, but obviously what we're trying to say is that, you know, uh, building muscle, keeping strong, keeping fit, keeping the machine working, uh, you know, you can tolerate maybe a little bit of dysfunction in other parts of that machine, the fitter you are. And that's the context of pulmonary rehabilitation. And it's absolutely essential. And I think probably why we focus on it um, in lung disease, when you have a lung disease, probably the broader value, and we probably hear from physiology today a little bit about probably all of us need to be thinking about keeping our bodies as fit as possible, uh, building our muscle mass from very early on. So the last slides, I think, just relate to what, what, would, would, what we feel is uh, important. Um, we have a very uh, engaged group of um, clinicians um, uh, around this country uh, really, really wanting to, to develop structures that uh, meet the following criteria. Obviously, we want to be at the best as we possibly can, as good as anywhere in the world at providing care. And we do a reasonably good job, but we can do better than that. Uh, we want the care to be patient-centered. I mean, I think we're, we're very aware in this country, it's a small country, but it's geographically, uh, um, uh, I, I suppose, quite rural in places. Uh, roads wouldn't be great in some places. Getting to clinics can be problematic. So we have to think a little bit about, you know, you, ca you, know, you can't really have one center in a country this size and how many should we have and how, how much expertise should be on each site and how close to home. 
And obviously, this gets to equal access, the same thing. So patient-centered and equal access. So that no matter where you live in the country, and no matter who you are or what you do, that you can get the same level of care. And that's the key. And these are key principles for everything we do. So what are the sort of things? I think the, uh, the British Lung Foundation, I mean, they're, you know, they're, 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 they've done a great job at putting together some ideas. And this is a very good document just released. There are statements and, and guidelines all over the world. And we're not interested in rewriting guidelines. Uh, what we're interested in is the following, um, and I think supporting somewhere, you know, a, a group such as like ILFA and, and them supporting us is so important. And I think the patient charter really outlines what people should expect for this condition, and it's very important. Um, we are very keen to develop specialist centres. We don't know exactly how many. There's about six at the moment that have a particular interest in this condition. That may be the right number. It may be too many, it may be too few, we don't know that, but we have to start building the centers. And it means that in each center, that uh, every patient, in my view, in this country, who might have this condition should at least have access to the diagnostic pathways that are there. What I mean by that is that the diagnosis is rigorous and has been looked at uh, with multiple heads, and that would be radiology and doctors and nurses with a particular interest in this. And it's, it's to provide that nidus of support around the country, possibly along the hospital groups partially, but, but to provide that nidus of support that you can feel that everybody gets the same level of diagnosis and then the treatment access after that. Doesn't mean that, the, that every patient has to present to that center, but it means that every patient has to have access to that. I think access to treatment, uh, at least at the present time, we have the treatment. There is nowhere in the world that I'm aware of that has um, access to different treatments than we have in this country. So we have the same treatments and we can provide the same treatments here. And you know, that's not, not every uh, doctor around the world can stand up and say that. So that's an important thing that we, we, we have the funding to do that. And that's been an investment in the government, uh, by the government in this, in this condition. Um, I think the, you know, the other aspects of treatment in terms of actually um, <clears throat> the clinic structures, support for structures, um, we were talking earlier, you know, if someone is out from clinic, you know, we don't have the depth of clinic you know, structures so that uh, one doctor can fill in for another, a nurse for another, you know, we don't have that. It's, it's largely reliant on people um, you know, double jobbing or being a single operator on a clinic, and we'd like to develop that further. And the last thing I put in this slide is in that context, we had a meeting last week that I think is important where um, um, Nicola was there from, from ILFA and nursing, physiotherapists, doctors, to try and write a position of what we think is the right way for the um, health service to begin to move to structure the care for people um, with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and other related interstitial diseases. Uh, and that relates to centers and it relates to staffing and it relates to access to resources. It relates to access to new trials in this condition, to look at new research in this condition and the rights of people who come in with this condition, how we can provide that. And we'll be issuing a statement within the next few months because we've just started that process. It takes a little bit of time to, to put that together. Um, and the last thing I put up here um, before I finish up is the registry. And what we've done is you're probably aware of that we've, we've, we've put a lot of work in the last three years in developing a registry. And a registry is a mechanism of recording clinical information on people with a condition um, from different places in the country um, and around the world, in fact. And being able to use that then to get a better sense of how common the disease is, what are the features of the disease, whether people are getting the right treatment, is there areas in the country where they're not getting the right treatment. So with that in mind, we have um, six centers which by and large represent where there's a specialist interest in this condition. And five of those centers um, are active in putting uh, in, 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 in the registry and one will be active in putting in the registry. So we'll have six centers that we'll be putting information in. And essentially, uh, th those centers then feed in information into a central, um, 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 I suppose, uh, system where uh, it's not related to the name or anything related to kind of um, confidentiality or, or lack or um, 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 it is an anonymous system, but allows us bring in that information and look at it and try and feed that back to people with this condition so we can do better with the condition. So it's related to the type of lung disease, the type of treatment and how things are going. So the summary then, as I finish up, is it is a condition that's becoming more common. And with that, uh, we are definitely developing um, a, a lot more information around the world uh, on this condition. Uh, we know it restricts predominantly the lungs and breathing and oxygen. Treatment is clearly uh, in a better place than it was five years ago, but uh, things need to be improved. And I think the drive in this country to provide uh, really an emphasis and momentum behind um, uh, um, treating people with this condition is, 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 is strong, and I think that's what we have to build on. And I just put up a picture of Galway. This is Salt Hill, and it wasn't taken on Monday anyway, that's for sure. <laughs>
So, um, so I, I'm going to stop there. If you have any questions, I can take them now. If that's